Hello, I am Pastor Dan Chapman of Cranberry Baptist Church. We are delighted that you have decided to watch one of our Sunday morning sermons. Watch and enjoy, but most importantly, learn from God's holy word and then apply its truth to your life. Let's go to God's word together. This past Tuesday, we celebrate. No, no, we didn't celebrate. We recognized the anniversary of 9/11. Obviously, I will not be speaking on Proverbs today. A time that was horrific, but a time to be remembered. Amen. And shame on us if we ever forget. We will always remember what we were doing and where we were. I had a little office in my house in the basement of our home, that Joanne and I, back in Tennessee when it happened. I get this phone call. It was Joanne. She was working as a nurse and had seen it on TV. And she, Her words were simple, Dan turn on the TV. It didn't matter what channel because they all had it. And I spent most of the rest of the morning because I nobody, you know, everybody just at that point and I could I could just shut down everything and just watch. There's been other times in, uh, in uh, of, of our history as a nation of something similar. Now I was not around at this one but the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I remember in hearing uh, of the radio, the rebroadcast of the radio where uh, President Roosevelt talked about the uh, the bombing there in Pearl Harbor. Of course, most of us have seen the movies and that type of thing. But again, horrific time. And then I remember the assassination of uh, John Kennedy. Uh, I was in high school, uh, I think a junior, best I remember, and I remember there was a special assembly called down at the gym where you just, we all went and the school announced it to us that uh, President Kennedy had been shot. And but I think by that time he had already passed. I don't remember that, but I remember very well where I was. I want to speak to you today. Well, no, I want to go before I do something else. There's other things we want to remember. Uh, births. Uh, Jeremy's been the closest one on them. The last one is that uh, in his first, Ava, about uh, two years ago. In, uh, and just, you know, I remember very distinctly holding my daughter the first time. And my, just looking at it, not believing that that little thing uh, has my DNA and was part of me. It, uh, was, now that you celebrate. We'll always remember some of the deaths of our family. My mom's accidental um, death in a car accident was one of those shockers that, again, that you'll never forget. But even then, I have I remember uh, others um, that has passed on. Wedding days, and guys, you better not forget your wedding day. If, if you get it tattooed, I'm not in for tattooing, but if you can't remember, put it on your hand or something where you won't ever forget. But those are days that, uh, um, as I was reflecting on this, and Joanne has no idea I was going to say this, but when we got married, we had a very small home wedding, uh, about 20 of us, I think, thereabouts. And uh, we, uh, uh, her brother-in-law, uh, her sister's husband, was a pastor, and he he was standing in the living room, and I was standing there beside him, and her two boys walked her from the dining room into the living room where everybody had kind of gathered, and uh, mainly family and very dear friends. And we exchanged our vows, and, and the service was right there. And then we uh, was dismissed to the dining room where we had punch and snacks, and you know, but what a great day. Memories, severe accidents. Again, on the negative side, but, but you don't forget things like that. I'm here to tell you, we need to remember some things. It's crucial that we do not forget some things. 
Some memories need never to be forgotten. They can bring great joy and comfort. Our lessons never to be repeated. You see, we have a tendency to forget things or let it dim with age. Like the 9-11, we don't ever want to forget what happened. Just like the bombing of Pearl Harbor. That doesn't mean we don't forgive. doesn't mean that we don't try to build roads of, 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 of clear taking care of the problem. Um, and I just think that there's we must remember. I want to go on. I want to talk to you today about God remembers. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. We're going to start off 1 through 3. But the whole chapter I'm going to go through, and I'm not a lot of it's not going to be on the board. So I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 2. You know, I put most of the verses up. It's just too much. And we're not going to look at every one because it's 37 verses. It's about two and a half pages in my Bible. And that's just way too much to try to, to, to put all on the screen. And we're actually going to do a little bit into chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And first, before I ever start reading, I want you to remind you something. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. You have a book of, that follows this called Lamentations, which was written by Jeremiah as well. And what I want you to understand before we ever get into this, Jeremiah, because he did cry a lot, he literally wept as he preached and as he prophesied that we need to understand that God chose him to express his heart, God's heart. That when Jeremiah was weeping, he was weeping for God. That when Israel saw the prophet of God weeping, it was God speaking through him weeping. You understand that? That's key. So what I'm going to share with you today, from the very beginning is that God's heart is broken. God's heart was broken over sin every day, but on 9-11, God's heart was broken of the devastation that happened that day, of hatred and anger. But at first, I want us to go through 1 through 3, and I'm going to read it just right out of the scriptures here, and you can see it there. But I want you first to see as God sets the stage. Chapter 2 of Jeremiah, starting with reading with verse 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, that's Jeremiah, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to come back and look at it. I remember you, so God remembers. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal. When you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the firstfruits of his increase. All that devoured him, Israel, will offend. Disaster will come upon them, the ones that are, are trying to destroy Israel, says the Lord. Now I want to break this down, because I think you need to see this in, in much better uh, and I just kind of just broke them down into little phrases because every phrase has a message. The first one, God says, I remember. I remember. Can God forget? No. Can God forgive? Oh, yes. But it says, I remember you. Make this personal. That God, no matter what we go through in life, well, whatever we face, God will remember us us as individuals and our needs and our what we're going through God heart in desires that he that every one of us would be able to relate with him and 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 experience the love of Christ the blessing of Christ the protection of Christ and he starts out to, to this weeping prophet I remember you and, in, and he's making it very personable to all that would hear the second one the kindness of your youth 
The Lord God speaking through the prophet here, he says, I remember in your early days when you weren't even mature yet, that, that there, was, there was something about you that, that cared for others. And, and he says it like in a longing of, of wishing those days were back again. And I love the next one. The love of your betrothal. When, the, when a, a man and a woman are about to be married and when that first wedding night and that first time, there, the, even in the engagement time coming up, there's kindness and there's tenderness and there's, there's lots of love and, and joy and, and laughter and, and people can literally um, know and experience the, the tenderness. Um, I can remember talking on the phone uh, to Joanne before we got married and, and she had to get up really early back then because she was a surgical nurse and I, I think she had to leave the house at about 5.30 or something like that and, uh, so she had to be in bed fairly early but we would in that engagement time we would talk till 10 or so at night you know, and, and we both had to get up early but it didn't matter because love was fresh and it was in, it was in the, the blue of its state and it was so great. And, and, and God says, I remember you, Israel. I remember you, my children. That, that when, when we first had a relationship, how much I loved you and you loved me. Just as a husband and a wife when they come together in those early days, that there's lots of laughter, there's kidding, there's teasing and uh, playfully. And, and there's just... Just lots of an affection going, flowing. I don't know about you, but that's a picture of God's love for me. You understand that? We are called the bride of Christ as Christians. Israel was considered a bride of God the Father. You have that image, and it's in itself a loving one, not the physical intimacy that a that a physical marriage has, but it's, it's that tenderness and that love and that compassion for one another. If you don't hear what I'm saying now, you're going to lose a lot what I'm about to say in a, in a little bit. The love of your betrothal, when you went after me or when you followed me in the wilderness and is speaking there as, as God brought them out of Egypt and out of, brought, brought them out of bondage. <clears throat> and they went into the wilderness and where God provided them, gave them the manna, He gave them water to drink. He took care of their every need. He said, you followed me. Then it says, in a land not sown, when He took them on into the land of Canaan, speaking of Israel, that was a time of the, the land of milk and honey. All, everything was, was provided. The houses were built. The vineyards were already not only planted, but producing. There was crops. They didn't have to. They just went in and took took it. God says, this is my love gift to you. The next one, it says, Israel was holiness to the Lord. Israel understood that, that, that they were a holy nation. They were to be a nation that would follow God explicitly and completely. The first fruits of His increase. That this was the, uh, the, the development from the time, remember you, you had the promise to Abraham and then to his son Isaac and Jacob. Then you had the twelve tribes beginning. And then in Egypt, a lot of the Bible scholars said there was probably two and a half million people came out of, of Egypt when they came out of the, the slavery. And he says, you are my first fruits of how I am working the plan of salvation. Going on. And then is the last one is, is the two sentences are together, and it's his provision of protection. All that would devour him, speaking of Israel, will offend. They're going to offend me. You touch my child, I'm going to get you. That's what it's basic. Because disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. Do you see what the image I want you see here? God says, I, re I remember you. I remember those intimate times that we had, the sweetness let me ask you a question. Think about when you got saved. Think of, I mean, that, that time in your life when you first accepted Christ. Wasn't there a joy? Wasn't there a... You thought, wow, God is so real. And that's what I want you to remember too. God remembers those days. God remembers that fervency and that warmth and the excitement of a relationship with you. And he longs for it today. When we say God is love, that's not a trite statement. 
That's a statement of truth. It expresses his love for us, Mary. And, and that blows me away. It does. That God could love me that much. Now, I don't know about any of you, but I've kind of messed up some in my life. And then when I think about all of that great, holy, precious love, and yet I look at me and what I've done at some times in my life, which I'm greatly ashamed, and yet he says, I still love you. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated or proves his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. You see, we've got to start here. When God remembers, he thinks of what? The relationship that he wants with each one of us. Okay? Now, I'm going to speak to you about, I'm going to pull some passages out of this, this chapter and a little bit out of chapter 3. And I want us to look at it. And I think at times you're going to see yourself. And when you do, I want you to say, Oh God, please forgive me. I'll be honest, I have asked God to give me tears as I preach this. This is not in your face hellfire damnation type message I, I don't first I don't like doing that that's not who I am you see <laughs> I'll use a silly illustration um, Joel fixed a, a nice supper last night and and uh, what did I do without her asking by the way I helped clean off the table and I started you know why did I do that because I love her and she loves me I serve her because of my love relationship with my wife. I serve him because he loves me and he provides for me. I don't I don't serve him because I think he's going to hit me over the head with a baseball bat. Now he can and he definitely has the power to do that and I'm being very figurative in that speech but you understand God wants the, the, the first part of that he reminds them of what he wanted with them, and he still does. Let's look at these, some segments. The first one I want you to look at, um, let, let's just read with verse 4, and then we're going to stop at verse 7. And I'm just going to kind of set the stage here. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice! Have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me? Have followed idols and have become idolaters? Neither did they say, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt? Who led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits, and through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed, where no one dwelt? I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its good and it, its to eat its fruit and its goodness. And he says, they're arguing, who really brought us here? But he says, I brought you there and I brought you to a wonderful land, a place of provision. Then look at um, the next phrase in verse 7. I underlined it in my Bible. In fact, I underlined the word but twice. It says, but when you entered... You defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. Abomination to who? God the Father. What did they do? God says, don't marry the heathen, the, the pagan. You, you, you build a godly nation. Right? And it goes on. And the priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers have transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal. In other words, not God's word. They spoke of from another. And walked after these things that do not profit. Have you ever thought that, that Israel, with all that God did, all the miracles bringing them out of Egypt, God yet, they still said, Let's, what did they tell Joshua when they, they built the golden calf? You know, we need a God to follow. And they said, when they got the golden calf all made, they said, this is the God of Israel that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They started making idols. Now listen, I'm not talking about for today a golden idol like that. 
But anything that distracts us from serving Him becomes an idol to me. Let me use an example. If on our honeymoon with Joanne and I, if I had once said, I'm, I need to run to the store and get something, I'll be right back. And she said, okay. If I show up two hours later, now you've got to remember we're on our honeymoon, and it should have been a 15-minute excursion, and now it's two hours I'm coming back. And she said, where you been? I said, well, I met a, wa a waitress down there at the cafe, and, I, and she seemed so interested. I just had a wonderful talk with her. How would have she felt? When I begin to spend my time on something other than God, it is becoming spiritual idolatry and harlotry. And we're going to see that real clear in a minute. You see, it's easy to understand about a man beginning to have wandering eyes. But what I'm trying to get you to understand, when God remembers, He says, I've done it all for you. I've given you everything you need. He can say to us today, I gave my son to die for you. He lived the perfect life you could not. Where you could have a relationship with me. I will put my spirit in you and live within you. You can do nothing. You can think nothing. You can go nowhere that God doesn't know it. And listen, I'm again, I don't want you to understand. I don't want you to, to think where this is a, a hellfire type damnation. What you, you need to understand, God loves you. God wants an intimate relationship with you. As a husband is to love his wife, he wants to love you that way. And he wants your love back that way. Not because you have to, but because you want to. And that's what I want. That's the message today. We, God remembers, but we need to remember why we serve Him. Because if we don't, we will go astray. Amen? Raise your hand if you've ever went astray. Every one of us. Every one of us. And God broke God's heart. If I had done that, as I was talking about, went, talked to a waitress for two hours on my honeymoon, my wife would have been highly upset, rightfully so. We understand that. But when I said, well, hey God, I know you gave me your spirit, and, and oh God, I know that you, you love me and care for me, but oh, this is so much fun to, to spend all my Sundays on the golf course or on the lake or do whatever. Or what about a job that just steals your whole life from you, men? Where's your first love? And I hope it's not your wife. I hope your first love is with him. And wives, it's your first love to be with him. The perfect marriage is a triangle. God at the top and the husband and wife at the bottom. A three. And as we draw closer to God, we draw closer to one another. The closer we both come up that, that angle, that triangle, the closer we draw together and we become one in Him. And He is the essence of our love. He is the real, the, the truth of our love for Him and, and for one another. And what you have here, that when the, the children of Israel, when they went into the land of, of Canaan, it was a land of milk and honey. God says, get rid of everybody. They'll become snares to you and thorns to you, and they will lead you astray. And Israel said, well, that's a lot of work. And we don't want to do it. So they didn't. And they became snares and thorns, the people that they left in the land. Look at verse 9. Therefore I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children I will bring charges. I thought about that passage. If and I'm just going to use John, Johnny Jones and and, and Susie Q, okay? Because I don't want anybody to think that I've got anything here to say. This, if Johnny Jones and, and Susie Q get married and they have kids and they Johnny and, and Susie decide to live a life away from God and away from God's truth and, and, and practice things that are not of God in their life, what is those kids going to learn? An ungodly life. And if they grow up in a home of an ungodly life and an ungodly situation, what are they most likely to do? To copy that. Amen? It's really old me. You see, we want to sow our wild oats and hope that for crop failure. We want to do what we want to do and hope that our kids don't copy us. 
And the way it talks about here, the children of, and yet I will bring charges against uh, you and against your children's children. How I live will affect my children. They will affect them, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. I do not live on an island. And again, I don't want you to think it's what I've got to do. I want to live for Christ, to be holy before Him, pleasing unto Him, and I want my children to love Him. And that is my, my motivation. That is what I want to share with you here. God remembers. Do we remember? And I know, and I know it's true in your life too because you're human. We have a tendency to drift. By the way, have you ever noticed you don't drift towards godliness? I've never yet had anything drifted towards doing what God wanted me to do. I have to fight that. And I, I've found... I have found so much that when he's my highest priority before anything else, it's easy to stay in a right relationship with him. Verse 11, has a nation changed its gods which are not gods? Oh, but listen to this next phrase. But my people have changed their glory. Who's their glory? It's God. For what does not profit? Remember who's speaking? The weeping prophet, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is probably weeping. And as he is, see, when he speaks, it is God speaking through him. Back then, you did, they didn't hardly have the writing. I mean, they didn't have the book of Jeremiah yet. They had the Exodus and Leviticus and probably some of those things. But they didn't have the word of God as we have it today. And they began to walk away. We changed the glory into to things and the value and possessions. Verse 13, For my people committed two evils. They forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's the first evil. That they walked away from that which was fresh water, living water, meant flowing water. In other words, they could go to the well that was always fresh, not stale or stagnant, but it was sweet and, and it would quench your thirst and it was probably cool because it was in the, 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 um, the earth and this fountain that was constantly coming up and it was had refreshment. One year I worked on um, with a farmer who was between my senior year in high school and my freshman year in college, I helped a farmer put up a lot of hay that summer. My goodness, he about killed me out on that farm. And I, I honest, you laughed, Clyde. You know, I mean, there's not much harder work than lifting hay. And um, in the morning, we'd put hay up in the barn, and then all afternoon, we would bale and moor to put up the next morning. I mean, he about killed me that summer, and I'll never forget that. He had a well, a deep well. Now, it was not cold like re from refrigeration, but when you turn that hose on, it was that coldness. I never had anything to taste so good in all my life because I had sweated and got so thirsty out there. And that's when I hear a lit fountain of living water, I get that image. The second one, and they, they've left that and hewed themselves cistern, broken cisterns that can hold no water. That's water that just sits there. It's not fresh. It's not near as good. It can sustain life, but it's not any good. Another passage or two, and then I'm going to go on and kind of bring it to it. Go to verse 20. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds. God says, I've delivered you from bondage, speaking of Egypt. And you said, I will not transgress. That you were so happy in those early days. Oh, thank you for taking my yoke off. Thank you for giving me out of slavery. And God, I will serve you. How many times have we said that and messed up? More than we like to admit, I'm sure. At least I can say that. Oh, now look, listen to this next phrase. When on every high hill, they would burn incense on the high hills. They would create little altars. They may not sacrifice animals on every altar, but they would burn incense to the different gods around. Now listen, it's, it's, it's an imagery. You lay down playing the harlot. And he's literally talking about spiritual adultery. Say, so you're my wife, he said to Israel. You are my promised one. 
and I love you and you have loved me but you went out and you followed the things of the world and the image of that is you've laid down and committed adultery with the things of the world that's pretty harsh now look at chapter 3 verse 1 and uh, the, the last part it says but you have played the harlot with many lovers and then he says yet return to me yet return to me Not only does it say it yet return to me there in Jeremiah, but in Malachi chapter 3 verse 7, yet from the days of your father you have gone away from my ordinances, my teachings, my, 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 my words, and have not kept them. Listen to what God begs. Return to me, and I will return to you. It's the situation of a husband that's wife has been unfaithful and has chased after many lovers and he comes to his wife and he says, if you will return, if you will come back to me, I will receive you to myself and I will love you as my wife again. That's what that verse is saying. Zechariah chapter 1 verse 3, Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. Over and over. In fact, I think six times this very phrase, Return unto me. Return it to me. In Malachi chapter 3 verses 16 through 18, it's, it's a little bit of a longer passage, but I want to read it to you. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. Check out the word. Then those who feared the Lord, that's the ones that God is listening to. Do you see that? and heard them so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name so not only are they fearing the Lord they are listening to to what God is saying they are putting the word of God in their life and now they're even in uh, the end of part of this verse they're meditating on the things that God is teaching them that's what it's saying there verse 17 they shall be mine says the Lord of hosts on the day that I make them my jewels and on my precious ones the things that, that I hold in great uh, that are, have great value they are mine and I have died for them it's, of course speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ on the day that I make them my jewels and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him in other words some, a landowner a rich man that son is there and that's, that's being found faithful as the, that very rich man would protect his son from the heat of the day and, and the hard labors of life I will protect my son Verse 18, then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. I see this again, that God is crying out to all of his children of Israel and chose, calling out to us, return to me. Now listen, I don't think for one second that any of you bow down to an idol as we think of an idol this week or this past month or even this last year. But I tell you what, there's been times in our life this past year that we've struggled and we've, we've chased the things of the world. Oh, I bet this makes me happy. I like doing this and I like doing that. I like going over here. And, and well, God, I'll, 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 I'll make time for you sometime. See, that's idolatry. God wants all of our heart. Joanne wants me to love her with all of my heart. God first, but then everything else belongs to her. Amen? And that's the way it's supposed to be. And, and he says here, I will spare you as, my, as a man will spare his own son if, if I put him first. And this is, and I close with this thought. This is right on Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I, I've kind of ex, ex, um, reduced it on some of the things that I could. This is the, one of the letters of the seven churches. This is to the church of Ephesus. And he says, and think of, now God is speaking to a church, obviously the people of the church, not the church building, but the church, the people. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. In other words, you, you don't even want the people that are going astray to, to be around you. 
And you have tested those that, who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. In other words, they searched the word of God to see if the truth was there. And so this is it's so important. He says, you, weren't, you didn't just come to church. You were, you were doing some good things here. Uh, you, you labored for me. You had patience and you, you kept the evil away. Verse 3, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. You're staying after it. Then he says to this great church of Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, remember we're talking about remembering a lot today. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come quickly and remove your lamb stand from his place. I believe that is speaking to the church and not to an individual unless you repent there's a word that's used several times in the prophets called backsliding what is backsliding it's where we lose that first love you see God wants to be number one God wants us to have a love for him as a husband loves his bride because that's why he loves us and he wants us to serve him not because he's going to smack us if we don't but because he loves us and remember Jeremiah is the weeping prophet he is the one that was saying that God was speaking through him probably through tears when he told them all of their times that they had been a, a, they practiced harlotry and again the harlotry is a terrible word but yet when we take our love and we go for anything other than his approval and his love then it's called spiritual adultery it's called backsliding it's called getting out of the will of God and what do we do when we realize we're there let me as we repent let me say one more thing and, and I'm done the easiest thing in the world is to go after the things of the world. I, I confess to you, I love a hot shower in the morning. And aren't you glad I took a nice shower this morning? <laughs> I, but I don't need a house with 20 showers in it. I really don't need a, shower, a house with more than one. Uh, some of you probably grew up in a home that didn't have any shower in it. I, I, I do remember the very earliest of my recollection of life I mean I was just a little boy is I remember the big day that dad put an inside bathroom in our house because dad could fix and do and what a treat it was not have to go to the little house behind the house but most of my life I've had indoor plumbing and then as I grew older my granny that I love so dearly had the little house behind the house so I got to experience at times when we'd spend the night with her that joy <coughs> and I'm being very facetious the easiest thing in the world is to get caught up that you have to wear a pair of jeans that has a certain name on it or tennis shoes that has a certain name or to, to drive a certain kind of car or to do this or have this see the world screams you can't be happy unless you live like I live and when I chase the things of the world I'm not chasing him I guarantee you my beloved wife here does not want me flirting with anyone even if it didn't go anywhere other than a flirt because she wants my heart and if my heart is given to her, then I won't be flirty. you understand? God wants your love like that. God remembers you and what he wants to do in your life. And you need to remember what he's done for you. And now live your life. A verse that I've just recently memorized 
and he died for all speaking about Jesus that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again you see my life is to be lived for my king my lord every moment of every day no exceptions that's when our we have our first love is into it. and I close with this it's past time but I, I, I just this I heard the message I, I you know what really got me thinking now I, I, what happened on this 9-11 was 100% wrong but you know what God broke my heart about here was people storming embassies wrongly for their love for their God they were all upset about somebody wrote some little ditty or some little movie or some little video thing and they were so much focused on they're radical now I'm not, I don't believe you need to be radical to go out and shoot, hurt people and destroy property but where's your love see they have a love that's beyond I heard a story many years ago it was back when the communism was so back this was probably back in the 60's and I read this story and a, and a communist said to an American he said we will rule you someday and the man says well why do you say that he says we believe more in what we believe than what you do in what you believe and the guy says what do you mean he said, and then the communist looked at him and he says how much do you give to your nation or how much do you give to your God and the guy kind of hesitated he said well let me tell you what I give he said I give 50% of every dollar I make to the communist party because I believe in it now I'm not asking you to give 50% of your income but you see the heart where's our heart Christianity is, a real, is, is, is from the heart the way what we buy the way we raise our children how we treat our wives how our husbands, the wives treat our husbands I mean how we inter, inter work that we're quick to, to help others and not get so caught up in selfishness you see this Christianity and again I say it Christianity is to be lived not just taught it's a life Okay, every head bowed, every eye shut Father I pray for every individual here Lord I went a little over today in time and I know that's okay but Lord I pray that you would do a real work in every heart help us to examine our hearts to see if we've left our first love that we've got so busy living this world in this world in 2012 that we have lost the heart for you father that we have that we've got so caught up in life that we forget why we're even here and that is to love you and to serve you to honor you and exalt you god give us that heart again Forgive us, God, where we've failed you. God, forgive us where we've put other things in front of you. And oh, God, that we would live for you. For I believe you long, God, for those days when we were first saved and, and when we first came to you and how that we could serve you and we promised you all kinds of things like, Lord, I'll live my life for you. And Lord, we have strayed at times. Please forgive us. And get us our eyes focused again unto you. Especially our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The author and the finisher of our faith. And Father, that our love would go and we serve you, Lord. Out of a heart of love. Not of, 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 of anger or, or out of must being a, a set of rules. But oh God, because you loved, first loved us. And that we become lights of your grace and your glory. To be salt on the earth. You say be the salt be the salt of the earth. God, that wherever we go, we leave a, a sweet savor, a savor of, of holiness, a savor of, of of who you are. God, touch every heart here. And God, if there's anything that has separated us, our love from you, Lord, help us to see it and confess it. 
and, and turn from it. Fathers, we're about to have communion. Let this also be a time of examining ourselves to say, am I right with God? Lord, I pray that you would show every heart here any wrongness, anything that that has come between you and us, that we may repent. And Father, that we may, oh God, that we may turn to you. God, do your work in us, that you may do your work through us. We ask it in your name. Amen. Thank you for listening to one of our sermons today. We pray that it was a blessing and a time of learning. If we could ever be of service to you or you would like to know more about us, please check out our website at cranberrybaptist.org. May God richly bless you.